The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Daniel Fusco Ministries. Check this out from today's edition of Real with Daniel Fusco. And so much about what God wants for our lives is for us to not live in the flesh, but in the spirit. And in the spirit, we are satisfied. All this happened because Ahab broke the simple sin in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet. When was the last time you came to the Lord and apologized for the ways that our rebellion against God has impacted negatively our relationship with God? Sometimes when you're looking at a situation, you just miscalculate it. We've all made those mistakes, right? We all, when you think, man, this situation where I just miscalculated everything, I got it wrong. Now, a lot of times in our miscalculations, we just make, you know, we, we don't, it's not because we're selfish or, or, or bad. Sometimes we just get some things wrong. And, and unfortunately, because uh, none of us know all things as the Lord does, because none of us has, uh, you know, been able to see in the future and understand everything, um, nobody gets everything right. So mistakes happen. But there are other times when our miscalculations come because we're being selfish, greedy, and just straight up sinful. The reason I bring this up is because we've been looking in this series that we're calling Crisis, and we're, and we're looking at the, the life of the prophet Elijah, right? And within the, the life of the prophet Elijah, the, the real struggle for the children of Israel is that they have this king, King Ahab and his wife Jezebel, who are a strong influence that are pulling people away from worshiping the true and living God. And the whole society has the impact of this, 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 this evil influence. And today we're going to look at a passage of scripture where we really see that Ahab and Jezebel make an enormous miscalculation, just a huge miscalculation that has catastrophic consequences for them. So in order to get at this, I want you to open up in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 21. Picking up 1 Kings 21, I'm going to read a pretty long section. I'm going to read about 16 verses, so I would love for you to be able to read along. Don't check out because a lot of things go on here. So this is what it says. 1 Kings 21 verse 1 says, and it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth and, and, and saying, give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is near next to my house and for it I will give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So Ahab went into his house sullen, displeased, because of the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down in his bed, and he turned away his face, and he would not eat. Verse 5. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat food, and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And she wrote letters to ah in Ahab's name, sealed them with a seal, and sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters, saying, verse 9, proclaim a fast and seat Naboth the, with high honor among the people, and seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, saying, you have blasphemed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him that he may die. Verse 11. So the men of the city and the elders and nobles who were inhabitants of his city did as Jezebel had sent to them 
as it is written in the letters which she had sent to them. And they proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth with high honor among the people. And two men, scoundrels, came in and sat down before him. And the scoundrels witnessed against him, against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. Then they took him outside the city and they stoned him with stones so that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. So it was when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab got up and went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Now, you see what a mess this is, right? Like, like this, the, this whole story is, is so sad. But, but really, there's a reason this happened. And it's the great miscalculation of the life of King Ahab. And it's simply this. What you have to realize is that the flesh is never satisfied. The flesh is never satisfied. It never gets all that it wants. And we see this playing out in the life of Ahab. Because Ahab... He's the king of Israel. He has got multiple houses. He, he's got where he lives in Samaria. He's got summer houses, beach houses. He's got the whole thing going on, right? And he's looking in, 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 Je, in Jezreel, and, and next to where he's living, there is this vineyard of this man named Naboth. And, and as Ahab is looking, he's like, that would make an awesome vegetable garden. I want that, right? And so he goes to Naboth, and, and he says, hey, listen, your land is right next to my palace. I would love to put a beautiful vegetable garden there. So listen, let me buy it from you. I'll give you money for it, whatever much you want. Or I'll give you a better vineyard. Just let me have that one. And, and Naboth says, no. He says, this was given to my family. And, and it's wrong for me to give you the inheritance that's from my father's. It's for my family. So the answer is no. And, and Ahab goes home and he's sullen. He's bummed out. He, he's like a spoiled kid who did not get ice cream for breakfast. Jezebel shows up, his wife, right? He's like, she's like, what's wrong with you? Like, why, why, are you, why, aren't you, why are you not eating? You know, it's just kind of like an Italian mom here. Like, what well, you eat? Like, why aren't you eating? Right? And then he explains, her, I, wanted, I wanted Nabal's vineyard. I want to put a vegetable garden there. And he said, no. And, and then she's like, you're the king. You can do whatever you want. You know? And, 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 and sure enough, she devises her plan. Her plan, declare a fast, give Nabal the seat of honor, put two liars, two scoundrels next to him, and say that he blasphemed God and blaspheme the king, then kill him, and then, and she doesn't tell the people that, but ultimately it's so Naboth can get his vineyard, you know, and sure enough, the whole scene plays on out, and, Na and Naboth gets killed, Just, you know, it, Jezebel's like, go ahead, take the vineyard, and the king's happy, he, he doesn't even ask why, right, he just wants what he wants, but here's the deal, all this happened because Ahab broke the simple sin in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet. He looked at Naboth's land. He thought this would make a great vegetable garden. Now, here's what you got to ask yourself. Is a vegetable garden worth the life of Naboth? I, 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 when you ask it, when you put it in those terms, it's kind of like, well, definitely not. It's definitely not worth the life of Naboth. But because the flesh is never satisfied... Flesh wants what it wants. And of course, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 20 tells us that hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. If we're thinking things in the flesh, it's never satisfied. Even though Ahab and Jezebel had more land, more material things, still not satisfied. He was sad he couldn't have the vegetable garden where he wanted. He could have had a vegetable garden. I mean, he was living in a palace. He could have taken a part of his palace, made a beautiful vegetable garden. But he needed Naboth's. And listen, our entire culture runs on this premise. Our economy runs on it. Where we are constantly advertised to, this is going to make you happy. You, unless you have this, you are not going to be happy. 
And so much about what God wants for our lives is for us to not live in the flesh, but in the spirit. And in the spirit, we are satisfied because Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. And we find our satisfaction in the Lord. And then we can enjoy different things in our life, but we don't find ourselves consumed with them. See, that's why in a lot of ways, the Bible invites us, and Jesus, as we, as we follow him, invites us into a life of generosity, because without it, our whole life is, this is what I want. This is me getting. And we think, I'll be blessed when I receive. And Jesus says, no, no, you're more blessed to give than receive. So Jesus turns the table. He says, look, the world that you live in is upside down. I'm going to teach you how to live right side up. So you give. And you, what you find is you find great joy in giving and then you get to enjoy things around you but you don't need any of it because you have everything that you need. And for a lot of us, we are making the same miscalculation that Ahab and Jezebel are making. One is that it's okay to want whatever you want and it's okay to get whatever you want by whatever means necessary. But if you're in the spirit, then as you're in the spirit, you are fulfilled in Jesus. And then in the ways that we live in this material world, we put things in the right place. Because Ahab was not going to be content. And look at what they did to get it. I mean, this, this man, this honorable man who wants to honor his family by not selling their inheritance, now loses his life over a vegetable garden. You know, and, and maybe, maybe your struggle is not that you end up, you know, you end up getting people killed for what you're doing. Maybe it's way less, but either way, it's still sin. And God invites us to, to look at things differently because of our faith in Jesus. Now, look at what happens from here. So in, in, in 1 Kings 21, and then picking up in verse 17, listen to what happens next. Because don't miss the fact, there's somebody who knows what just happened. And it's not just Jezebel. Look at what happens, verse 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tithbite, saying, Arise and go down and meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, in the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. So Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he said, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 21, Behold, I will bring calamity on you, and I will take away your posterity, and I will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel both bond and free, and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, the dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dog shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. You know what the big mistake that Ahab and Jezebel make and Elijah is helping them realize it, is that they did not properly count the cost. And you and I need to learn how to properly count the cost. See, Jezebel mistakenly believed that because her husband was the king, he could do whatever he wants. That, that she could, because of her powerful position, she could send these letters to the noble people or the leaders of the city setting up Naboth and that no one was going to know what the plan was, why this was happening. And because she was the, the queen, they just had to do it and they did it. But no, listen, the Lord knew exactly what was going on. And the Lord talked to his prophet and said, I want you to go meet Ahab because Ahab has offended me. See, what we all have to remember is that we are so busy trying to mitigate or make sure that the sins we commit don't hurt people, but we have to remember that truly when we sin, the first person we sin against is the Lord himself. We sin against God, and then the impact hits people. And that's why the Apostle Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. 
but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, for Ahab and Jezebel, Jezebel just wanted her husband to be happy and not be grumpy over the vegetable garden. And Ahab just wanted Naboth's vineyard, right? And so they didn't properly count the cost of what they were doing because they sinned against God and God was offended. God knew what happened. Now, can we just, just like plain talk here for a second? My friends, listen. When was the last time you came to the Lord and apologized for the ways that our rebellion against God has impacted negatively our relationship with God? See, I think very much our culture is, uh, it's only wrong if you get caught kind of a culture. Like, like people will apologize when they get busted, but they won't repent before they get busted because they realize that they've offended God first. See, we're we're so busy fearing people. We're so busy wanting to protect our reputations that God, because we need to live upward first, God wants us to to realize that every sin we commit on this earth, we really offend God first. And this is exactly why God sent Jesus in the first place because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That all of us have paid the wages of sin and when you pay the wages of sin, ultimately the bill comes as death and that is why God has given us the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. That is why we believe in Jesus. That's why I have no problem in any context saying I am happy that I believe in Jesus because I realize I paid a lot of wages of sin in my life and not just before I got saved. Now that I am walking with Jesus, I am even more aware of my failings because I'll do something the Spirit of God would be like, oh, Daniel, you can't do that. Or, yeah, you didn't say that, but you thought this, this, and this. And and, and I get convicted by the Spirit because God loves me too much as his child to not disappoint me. And, and, And what Ahab and Jezebel did not realize is that this was gonna be the end of it. Because God's judgment for Ahab and Jezebel's treachery was going to be nasty. It was going to be nasty. Notice what he says in verse 19. In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. And then you get to verse 24, or no, 23. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, the dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dog shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city, and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. Now, you can imagine, if you've ever traveled, we don't have it as much going on in America where you have stray dogs and they're, and they're, and they're roaming for food. And so the idea of a dog licking your blood means that you're, you're, you're dead in the street and the stray dogs are coming and they're being nourished. And, and literally for Jezebel, for Jezebel, you know, the dogs are going to eat her in the street. And so this speaks of the most shameful type of death, right? So, so, so when Elijah's saying this, he's saying, you guys are going to die and your entire lineage is going to be cut off. Like, you're not going to have anybody left from your family. Remember, when we studied in the last chapter, uh, Ahab's son was not going to be the next king of Israel. And so, so God was literally going to cut off the line of Ahab and Jezebel because this is like the final straw. All the stuff that they had been doing had been evil all along. But now the, the murder of this honorable man, Naboth, for his vineyard, now God has had enough. It's time. They did, and we have to learn how to properly count the cost. You know, it's a beautiful thing that God is a patient person. You know, like the first time we ever sinned, we could die right there and, and that could be the end of our lives. And God is, is long suffering with us. But sometimes we forget that there's still a reckoning for the ways that we live. And that's why I'm so grateful. That's why I, I encourage you. Listen, you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus. You need a savior. You have failed infinite numbers of times. Huge ways, little ways. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We need to properly count the cost. Now notice what happens, and, and, and in some ways, what happens next just blows my mind. Listen to what it says, verse 25. It says, But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. 
and he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all that the Amorites had done whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So it was when Ahab heard those words that he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and he fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tithbite saying, see how Ahab has humbled himself before me. Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. Now, you see what just went on there? Verses 25 and 26 reminds us what a horrible king Ahab was, right? It says, there was no one as bad as Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness. Why? Because his, his wife Jezebel stirred him up, incited him. So, so he was making his own decisions and he was doing it being stirred up or incited by his wife. And it says, and he behaved very abominably in following idols. So he, he led in idol worship. But then notice what happens when he hears, even though this dude was so bad, what we learn in these verses is that God's mercy is extraordinary. God's mercy is extraordinary because when he hears the judgment that's coming, he tears his clothes. Now, this wasn't getting real. When someone, in the Bible, when someone tears their clothes, this wasn't like the day and age in which we live where it's like you can get your favorite outfit delivered to your house in four days and everyone's got closets and storage units. You know, it's like this was long before those type of days. So, so people had one or two pairs of clothes. That was all they had, you know? And so tearing your clothes was not like a small thing. And it was another thing for a dignitary or a king to tear his royal garments as well. So this was a very strong outward act of repentance. So he tears his clothes. He puts on sackcloth. Now, sackcloth was an undergarment that would normally be made of a camel's hair. It was very uncomfortable. It wasn't like putting on your favorite, you know, linen jumpsuit that was the most comfortable with your favorite tennis or anything like that. This was literally putting on uncomfortable clothes and then it says that he he you know he fasted and he lay in sackcloth and he went about mourning and so so the king now has these very strong outward um, expressions of humiliation and when God sees that he says See how Ahab has humbled himself? Even though everything Ahab has done has been an abomination to God, now that Ahab is humbled, God is not going to give him what he deserves. He's going to be merciful. He's going to say, listen, because of this, I'm not going to bring the calamity. I'm, I'm not going to kill all of his offspring while he's alive. The, the full meeting out of this judgment is not going to happen. It's going to happen in, when he's gone. And listen, our God is a just God, but our God is also extraordinary in mercy. Listen to what Paul said, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? See, what he's saying is that because God is merciful, it's too easy for us sometimes to be like, oh, listen, God will forgive me. Even though I know I shouldn't be doing that, God will forgive me because God's a forgiving God. God is gracious. So even though I know it's wrong, I'm going to do it. No, no, no. Listen, because God is so merciful, we shouldn't do things that we know that break his heart. But when we do break his heart, our God is a merciful God. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what mistakes you've made, no matter how much you have been an abomination to God, no matter how many people you hurt, no matter how much sin you have committed, you've encouraged other people to commit, if you were to come to Jesus right now, God would be merciful to you. I believe that there are many of you right now, as you've been watching The Real Program, you are aware of the fact that maybe you've never before said yes to Jesus, or maybe along life's way you did say yes to Jesus, but you've gotten away from him. And as you're hearing this, you're saying to yourself, and I'm so happy that you are, I need to get right with Jesus. I want to receive God's grace. I want my sins to be forgiven. I want God to take my mistakes and separate them as far as I am from the east is from the west. I want that shame alleviated, and I want to be a part of God's family. 
If that's you and you're in that place today, either for the first time, or maybe today's the day you want to recommit your life to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. It's such an important moment. So I want you to simply pray this prayer with me. I'm going to say a line. I want you just to repeat that line. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for saving me. I believe in you, your life, your death on the cross, and your resurrection. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lead me and teach me to follow you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. And we all said together, amen. If you just said yes to Jesus, you just made the best decision you could ever make. And if you did say yes to Jesus, I want to get resources to you to help you on this journey. So pull out your mobile device and text the word SAVED to 51400. That info is on your screen. When you do that, someone from my team will get in touch with you to get some information so that we can get those resources to you. But don't go anywhere. I have a big idea I want to share with you that's definitely going to bless you. You can take part in the amazing work God is doing through the powerful message that although life is messy, Jesus is real. By partnering with Daniel Fusco Ministries, you help make programs like this available to people who may not otherwise experience the love and hope only found in Jesus. With your regularly scheduled partnership, your generosity can help transform lives forever. Go to danielfusco.com partner now and become a part of the Daniel Fusco Ministries support team with your regularly scheduled or one-time gift. Be the hands and feet of Jesus in your world and become a partner today. If you're looking for a church family in the Vancouver area, we invite you to check out Crossroads Community Church. We are a family of faith, fully engaged, transforming our community and our world. And we would love for you to be a part of what God is doing through the Crossroads family. Our main campus is in Vancouver, Washington. For service times and directions, visit crossroadschurch.net. Hey everybody, Daniel Fusco here. Welcome to today's Two Minute Message. No matter where you are, start your weekdays with an encouraging thought from Pastor Daniel. You'll find his popular two-minute messages on Facebook, or you can subscribe to them on YouTube so you don't miss any of them. Each weekday, Pastor Daniel brings insight and encouragement on important topics that affect your life in only two minutes or less. Join the community now. Go online and search for Daniel Fusco on Facebook or Pastor Daniel Fusco on YouTube. So even though we're almost out of time on today's program, I would love to stay connected with you. Go visit my website, danielfusco.com. Sign up for the weekly newsletter. We have all sorts of resources there. And I want to thank so many of you for praying for this ministry and also giving financially to help us get this simple message that Jesus is real out to more and more people. If you want more information on that, go to danielfusco.com partner. Join me on social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. You're there, I'm there. Let's hang out there. And also, if you don't have a local church, will you join us at Crossroads Community Church here at our campus in Vancouver, Washington? But we have our internet campus, which reaches the entire globe at crossroadslive.tv. Okay, here's the big idea that I want to share with you. God will always lead us to do things that we wouldn't normally do. But that's what walking by faith is all about. And never forget, there's a blessing on the other side of obedience. Okay, I got to go, but never forget, although life is messy, Jesus is real. And he loves each one of us in the midst of our messy lives. God bless you. I'll see you soon.